Hi, it's me, Bill Patton, with Visual Training for Tennis, and I'm here with my good friend, Brent Abel of webtennis.com, one of the major gurus of online tennis instruction. How you doing, Brent? Oh, fantastic. Uh, Bill, thank you very much. Just got back to the desert a couple nights ago, and and uh, even though the background behind me is uh, a photo, it looks, I'm looking out there right now, it looks just like it. So it's beautiful here. Yeah, and as for me, you can see I left my space suit at home. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be dead from the vacuum of space in a matter of moments, but we hope to squeak this little webinar in <laughs> quickly Good. before that yeah. happens. So Brent, here's a funny question. I'm gonna throw something weird at you because because we want to, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to tell you a little bit about us so that you know us and what we're all about. And then we're going to get right into the content. And then at the end, if you stay until the end, then there's going to be a giveaway. So stay to the end for the giveaway. Brent, what's your first recollection of our first good interaction? You know, we had known each other, I guess, online for a while. And then you invited me to, uh, you want to interview me down at Indian Wells few years ago um, out there in the, I don't know, one of the little park areas. Mm -hmm. And um, the heck did we talk about? I mean, it was, it, it was, was athlete centered coaching. I was doing the research for the athlete centered coach book. Okay. And, All right. you know, and it was general pick brain, pick the brains of Brent Abel. You know, I was very pleasantly surprised when you reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, let's, let's you've got some value let's make it happen let's do some stuff and um i'm i'm happy to call you a mentor and you know it's funny because i went through an interesting period of time in life where everybody in my family older than me had passed on and i became the patriarch so since that right time but kind of like trying to latch on to some older guys you know to like be a an unofficial uncle or whatnot all right. Well, I, so listen, I, listen I, I appreciate that. And I've been around the game long enough. And now I'm at an age, just turned 72 a couple of weeks ago. And I just feel like now is the time to sort of start dispensing the knowledge that I've gained over the over the decades. And, and look, I mean, we've all, we haven't figured out this game on our own. I mean, I got, I, I've had some great coaches and some great mentors my my, you know, myself, Tom Stowe being, being the biggest one of them all. But um, I got some, definitely got some help with, uh, or, or from Michael Wayman, who was over at St. Mary's College back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then another guy here in the Palm Springs er uh, area, Glenn Erickson, who's the, who's the tennis director, head pro at the Palm Springs Tennis Club. So, great. and I've worked with Dennis Ralston a little bit. And so, Let's dig into Dennis Ralston a little bit because uh, you named two people who've been influential with me indirectly, and the, and that's Stowe and Ralston. In fact, now that you said that, I'm going to add a little something to the because there's a visual thing that Dennis Ralston did with Chris Everett. All right, in this talk here, what you're going to get is you're going to become a more valuable tennis player. You're going to be able to have better strategies that are customized to you. And if you're a coach listening to this, you're going to become a more valuable coach because you're going to have more tools in your toolbox to work with a wider variety of players because these cookie cutter statements, watch the ball or keep your eye on the ball, they mean almost nothing. And so we're going to get into specific cues that work with different people. Not one of them will work with everyone. All right. Recently, I came across one of the top visual researchers in the world, and she has studied 100,000 athletes and found that no two of them have the exact same visual strength and weakness profile. The underlining the fact that you can't use just one thing to reach all of your athletes. Or if you're an athlete, you've been getting coaching from someone and that person does not understand that, we can reach you uniquely. So let's dig in. I have a little statement I wanna read here that your inner language and the language you use with others directs your mind to what you pay attention to. The level of specificity you use to achieve objectives shows the sophistication with which you can solve problems. Albert Einstein said the simplest solution is usually the best, but not simpler. 
what, five twelfths is almost one third, but not really, it's five twelfths. Your language should not be a one third solution for five twelfths. Watch the ball and keep your eye on the ball. Both contain errors in non-specificity and they create errors in and of themselves. Both lead to behaviors that seem intuitively right, but are anatomically wrong. You want to pitch in a little bit, uh, Brent? What, what, well, do yeah. you know, what do you know about why watching the ball is not a good thing to say? Well, it doesn't really help the player do what they initially need to do. And then and you, you and I have talked about this a lot in terms of spacing, right? The spatial distance that you need to set up for your next shot, that distance away from the path of that incoming ball. So for, for me, watch the ball, keep your eye on the ball has to be conditioned with you've got to make sure that you've got the right spacing you can have the best acuity the best visual contact with the ball but if you don't have the right spatial distance away from the path of that incoming ball and then you're just improvising stroke technique the whole time and for me as a player and for me as a coach my job is to create stroke technique that is repeatable that is simple that is minimalist is simple and easy to repeat and and i can't tell you bill how you should hit your forehand uh, until i kind of look at it and see well do you have the right spacing and mm -hmm. if you and if you do you're going to naturally start to want that result of being able to repeat it over and over i'm not talking about pushing but whatever your stroke technique is and so watching the ball you could be, you could have laser, laser contact with the ball. No, that's a great answer. Let me jump in. And, and also we're going to accelerate the pace with which we go here. Visual skills explain how, to me, idiosyncratic players have been so successful, like a uh, Fabrice Santoro, right? Who's solidly inside the top 50 for many years, right? And so he had very strange strokes, but only made possible by expert positioning. So you could have the greatest technique in the world, but if you're not on the right spot, then you're not going to hit the ball well. All right. Um, so the thinking determines the seeing. So it's the things that we say that direct people's minds to pay attention to the right aspect. And when you say watch the ball, there's no specificity to it. it also sounds so obvious. I know people are offended when you say watch the ball. Because it's obvious, right? Wait, you you think I'm not watching the ball? You have that low of opinion of me that you think I'm not paying attention, right? I mean, so there's some real negativity behind it. And keep your eye on the ball is a problem because it leads to people keeping pinpoint vision of the ball too early. Then you get psychotic motion of the eye, which leads to a gray out. And now you've got that volley that you had lined up for a winner on match point that goes in the net and you don't know why. You were keeping your eye on the ball the whole time. I mean, I've done it, not on match point, but you know, I've missed plenty of volleys because of that. I feel the pain. We're gonna use the word find, find the ball. Here's what happens. See where my mouse is. There's number one, sensory input to thalamus. Your vision goes there. And then data is sent to the amygdala and also to the cortex. Now, when you find the ball, here's what happens. It, the, you get the data goes to two places. But if you go here and you're finding the ball, the where, finding where it is, does this, it does number five, the amygdala blocks slow thinking. Your ability to find something, which happens very quick and it blocks the slow thinking. And then you go down here and you get the unthinking response. But when you're thinking, what is it? When you're trying to analyze what kind of shot is coming at me, then the amygdala, then the, what happens is you get the cortex gets involved and then you end up having the thinking response. That's part of the value of using the word find the ball. Any comments about that, Brent? Well, yeah, I, Bill Crosby was the assistant pro for Tom Stowe at the Berkeley Tennis Club way back in the day. And Bill Crosby ended up becoming uh, half of the number one doubles team or number two doubles team in the USA back in 
like 1960. And when I was working with Stowe, I, I went to I went to Bill one day, uh, the BTC, Berkeley Tennis Club, and I said, what do I, I've been doing all this, what do I need to do? And he said, look, you've been working hard, you're doing a great job, there's two things you have to do. And I said, okay, come on, Bill, give them to him, let's go, let's go. And he said, number one, find the ball. And number two, decide where you want to send it. So, and, and I, you know, as I recall, it was in that order, find the ball and just decide where you want to play it. And that was it. There was no, there was no stroke, there was no stroke technique, but, but what I got out of it is that, well, and he, and I, and, and I think I asked him at some point, what is the most important thing in tennis? And he, he always said, get into the, into the hitting setup position as soon as you can. Yeah. And so, and, and so finding the ball and deciding, you know, shot choice commitment is based on what I said before. It's based on spacing. So yes. a lot of players, a lot of players look at an incoming ball and go, well, I'm going to hit it over there, but they don't honor the spacing. They don't honor the shot setup position. In most other sports that involve a ball or a moving object, the possession of the ball always comes first. So beginners always learn to possess, catch the basketball, trap the soccer ball, get the puck on your stick. You, you, it's that possession that comes first because without it, there'll be no dribbling, passing, puck handling, or any other thing. But we, in our system of teaching has become so much about sending the ball, we don't receive the ball well. Another great thing about what you said is that there's nothing new under the sun. A lot, some of the greatest coaches in perpetuity have had this wisdom. What my course does is kind of collects all of the wisdom I've ever been able to find and puts it in one place. So this is why you want the course because it's all in one place and you've got a nice menu to choose from and there's going to be something that resonates with you. And I've had people say it changes their game. They just, they go up a level. Um, I had a guy uh, who was who's was taking lessons with me. He started in the last couple of weeks, and at first he was arguing with me. And I go, and I told him, I was like, "We can argue all you want. I love to argue, but it's it's not going anywhere." And so all of a sudden, so he's very resistant. I taught him one thing, and he said, um, "It's some not suitable for work stuff." And then he said, "You're a genius," and I'm like, "Well." Not really, I just have information that's very helpful, but thank you anyway. <laughs> when when you look at different parts of the ball, then different things happen. One thing that's been very interesting and, and amazing and fun, taking the player who just seemingly cannot hit topspin, having them look at the bottom of the ball, because most of the time, so a player can't hit topspin, it's because there's a perceptual problem. They think the ball is higher than it is. They don't realize how low the ball is. So then they take their racket back to a certain level and then boom, they get you get your flat shot. When you look at the bottom of the ball and then you say, make sure that your the top of your racket is below the bottom of the ball, it's like a light switch went off. And they now have a visual frame of reference with which to measure. And there's just something magical about looking at the bottom of the ball, helps you to see how low it is. I don't understand it, but it works. Conversely, the same thing is true for the player who always seems to have the big windshield wiper swipe up on the ball and, the, and you get the ball that goes poof, right? It has no pace. And it's just this big, soft, loopy thing that lands short on the court that the other player comes forward to destroy. The solution for them is to look at the top of the ball. And then what I do is I tell them, all right, keep the tip of your racket up with the top of the ball, which they almost never do, but it gets them to keep their racket up with the ball more. And now all of a sudden, boom, now they can hit a drive. They can hit a driving top spin with penetration. I had a girl that came to me and she was, in tears and I was the last resort coach. The mom reached out to me. The dad was the overbearing monster who wanted to drive her on to division one glory. And she was ready to quit. She couldn't hit anything but fluffy topspin. 
And I got her driving the ball and she started to believe in herself and her game. And she ended up playing division two because we actually defeated the myth that you, that it's division one or nothing. Just yesterday, I was working with a player and they weren't quite getting close enough to the ball. So I had her look at, I had her look at the outside of the ball. Do you have like a, a quick comment on this topic of yeah, seeing I think different any, parts of the ball? Any kind of, any kind of visual acuity or any kind of visual specificity as you're talking about what part of the ball requires that you're on balance. If you're not on balance, if you're, if you're slightly falling in or if you're whatever, you're going to have a really, really tough time maintaining good visual contact with a ball. When I worked with Mr. Stowe, Every Wednesday morning up at Napa, junior high school courts, 9 to 12, the first 20 minutes, we didn't hit a ball. All he had us do, and I was with a group of, four, of, of three other guys, three of them are the other three guys in the top five in NorCal in the men's open, and then little old me down around 300. We, 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 we just did shadow strokes, and the whole purpose of it was to get on balance. What does it feel like? to be on balance. And I'm sure you know, Bill, there have been a lot of studies saying that if you're off balance, especially if you're moving, yeah. what do your eyes want to do? Well, they want to find a stationary object to reorient yourself. The moving tennis ball is not that. All right, I want to jump in because now we get to the Dennis Ralston part, right? So Ralston was wor started working with Chris Everett because Chris reached out to him because Martina was just dominating her and she couldn't stand it so good for Chrissy to go and get and you know get it sign up a new coach and get a fresh perspective so one of the things that Ralston had her do is put her hand on her forehead while she hit her forehand because I guess I don't know what the problem was but the solution was to help her to understand that she was either tilting her head or she was mm -hmm. off balance or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So this is a great thing to do. Put your hand on your forehead and just, and, and experience what's happening with your head because your head will say a lot about what your balance is gonna be. Then after hitting a few like that, you can you can take your hand off of your head, and, but now that you touch it, you sort of are more, she got back to number one in the world. I mean, she worked on her fitness. She did a lot of other things. She started coming to the net more, blah, blah, blah. But that was a really key feature was the balance part. Well, Stowe had us actually put our non-racket hand on our stomach. He couldn't explain it. He says, I don't know why this works. But <laughs> when you put your hand on your stomach, it puts the focus on the core. Mm. And when you put the focus on the core, he just felt that you, you move with a whole lot better balance. When we talk and we think, we think in, like you said, in this sort of stationary way of, you see that okay? All right. I so do. what a great image that is. I love this picture. <laughs> and nothing about it is in focus. You can see the motion of the rack and all that. Folks, this is how it feels to play tennis when you're playing well. The game is a blur almost constantly. There are little moments where it's not. But the best part about that balance is, is Novak is incredibly balanced. Ball is a blur and what we need, what you need in order to reconcile that, and you, there's plenty of research that shows that your brain reconciles the blur very well. You know, this is influenced by Galway, where he, one of his exercises in the second book, uh, Inner Tennis Playing the Game, which is actually a better book. He talks about playing games where yourself, where you, where you just observe the arc of the ball, the trajectory coming in, rather than actually trying to have pinpoint vision of the ball, that your brain, and it's been proven scientifically that your brain does reconcile that and can use that to get you in better positions. We've got less than two minutes. What what do we do to wrap this up, Brent? Well, I'd like you to tell the folks about the course that you've got. And I'd love to know what's the number one thing that if I buy your course, the video training course, visual training, the number one thing that I'm gonna get out of it for my game. The number one thing is you will reduce errors by especially reducing the amount of miss hit. I mean, I almost never miss hit anymore since I've learned this stuff. That's also reassuring to my students when their ball always comes back, it makes it look like I know what I'm doing. You'll also make less errors because you will learn how not to see the ball. You'll learn what not to do because there's some things that people say 
and do and teach others that actually lead to things that seem intuitively right but are anatomically wrong and then because of that then you're not gonna feel like there's something wrong with you i remember feeling this way i remember the feeling of i thought i was doing everything right and i still miss nobody else does this how come i'm the only one but really you're not and many many people are plagued by this and some leave the game people get frustrated if i can go to number two you'll also be able to do what you said sort of pick a target on the court and hit to it. And that's one of the maxims of tennis. Every shot should have a target. We've reached the end of the time. In the notes below, you're gonna, there's a giveaway. So you go into the giveaway and you can get the free video, three most catastrophic and common visual errors and how to fix them immediately without go, more time in the gym or a crazy diet. Beautiful. Brent, thank you for Beautiful. your time. Always fun, Bill. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.